also the, the head of school. And uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I will explain first uh, the research area of uh, Professor Pesch and how it relates to the other research that we're doing here at, um, um, at the School of Computer Science and Information Technology. And uh, then I will uh, hand over to Professor Colotti, uh, our head of college, uh, who will then introduce uh, Dirk and uh, explain where he comes from and what he's doing here. Uh, and then Dirk will give his presentation, and I hope that at the end we will have a little bit of time for some question and answers. So the School of Computer Science and Information Technology uh, here at UCC carries out research in uh, four particular areas. These areas are artificial intelligence and data analytics, um, interactive media and HCI, security and privacy, uh, and ethics, and as well networks, uh, computer architecture, and software. And our research in these areas is supported by a number of uh, research grants. And among them as well uh, are four um, large SFI-funded research centers in which we are active. These are Insight, Connect, Lero, and uh, Confirm. And uh, Professor Pesh's work is, uh, as you will see, in the area of the Internet of Things. And that area fits into the theme of networks uh, and computer architecture. And so his work is carried out here at the school in the network systems uh, and cybersecurity research group. And uh, I'll hand over now to Sarah to introduce Dirk a little bit more. President, UCC colleagues, members of industry and the community, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the College of Science, Engineering and Food Science inaugural lecture series. In this series, we celebrate the appointment of senior professorial staff in the college, taught leaders in their fields who will drive exciting areas of research and teaching in the university with significant societal benefits. I'm delighted to introduce Professor Dirk Pesch, Dirk was born in Germany, where as a teenager, he developed two passions. He was active in the local athletics club and he was introduced to computer programming by a proactive maths teacher who taught the first computer science class at the school, starting his interest and passion for computer science and engineering. After completing the German equivalent of the Leaving Cert and subsequent military service, Dirk studied electrical engineering and information technology at RWTH Aachen University. He did his final degree project as an exchange student at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow, where he met his wonderful wife, Jane. And I suppose of particular note, and luckily for us, Jane is from Cork. After graduating, Dirk worked as a software design engineer with Nokia mobile phones in both Germany and England, particularly from 93 to 95. But after that, Dirk returned to Strathclyde in January 96 to commence a PhD and joined the mobile communications group of Professor John Dunlop. Upon completion of his PhD in 1999, Dirk and Jane moved back to Cork where Dirk took up a lecturing position at the then Cork Institute of Technology. At CIT, he taught computer networking topics in the departments of electrical and electronic engineering and computing and developed research activities that led to the establishment of the Nimbus Research Center, of which he became the founding director in 2009. Under his leadership, Nimbus became a leading center for application and industry focused research in Internet of Things and cyber physical systems applications. In December 2016, CIT designated him as professor. Dirk joined the School of Computer Science and Information Technology at UCC as professor of computer science, Internet of Things in February 2019. His research focuses on design and analysis of future network systems for the Internet of Things and cyber physical systems with applications in smart and connected communities and smart manufacturing. He is the director of the Science Foundation Ireland funded Center for Research Training in Advanced Networks for Sustainable Societies. And he's a co-principal investigator 
in the SFI Confirm Center for Smart Manufacturing and the SFI Connect Center for Future Networks. Dirk is also a steering committee member of the Cork Smart Gateway, a smart communities initiatives in Cork City and County. Dirk has co-authored over 200 publications in his areas of expertise and has been instrumental in attracting over 80 million euros in research funding, of which over 12 million euros has funded his own research. It is a great pleasure as head of college to introduce our Professor of Computer Science, Internet of Things, Professor Dirk Hesch. Dirk, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah and, and Utz for the very kind introduction. And, um, um, and so I'm, I'm delighted to be here uh, today and give my inaugural lecture. So I have a few slides to, to help me go through it. So let me uh, share my screen uh, for this. So I hope uh, it is visible uh, to everybody. So th the, the lecture is entitled Internet of Things and Sustainability and UCC has a very significant focus on uh, sustainability. And so I wanted to place the Internet of Things into that context. Um, but first, and Sarah has covered quite a bit already on this, but uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, how did I get to Cork and UCC. So um, I was born in Krefeld, uh, Germany, and Krefeld is, um, is if you see this as a little arrow there, it's uh, in the very west of Germany, very close to the Dutch border on the River Rhine uh, near Dusseldorf is probably the, the best known uh, bigger city. Cork is about the size of uh, uh, Krefeld is about the size of Cork, um, and Krefeld is known or used to be known for its silk um, uh, industry, silk fabric industry, and it attracted in the 1700s a lot of um, people from all over Europe. And uh, quite interestingly, uh, one of the the, the, the families that uh, were very big involved in um, in the silk industry was the von der Leyen family. And uh, most of you probably know Ursula von der Leyen, the uh, president of the European Commission and her family, her in, the in-laws of uh, are from Krefeld. Um, so it's a very prominent family. Um, Krefeld is also known for, for a big uh, chemical manufacturing industry. Um, but as Sarah said in uh, after primary school, I, I uh, went to the Gymnasium Frappuccianum, which is a, 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 a STEM-oriented uh, grammar school. And uh, in the early 1980s, I um, um, learned how to program at this very progressive maths teacher. And we started off with the Commodore PET, and some of my computer science colleagues might even remember this one. Uh, I learned how to program in BASIC. And then the school got uh, three Apple II computers and we then also learned how to program in Pascal. And that kind of really started me on this journey and developed my passion for, for computer science. Um, um, and this then led me after finishing the military service to, uh, uh, to go to RWTH Aachen University. It's the largest technical university in Germany. Um, and I enrolled in electrical engineering and information technology. And you might wonder why wasn't it computer science? And, when I was 17, there was a career fair in my hometown um, and the one person there from IBM was representing computer science and he talked me out of it. And as an impressionable 17 year old, it changed what I studied at university. But to be honest, I kind of always um, kept the, the computing side uh, to the fore. And, uh, um, and in, uh, as part of my, my degree course, I also spent, um, a considerable amount of time as a sort of student intern uh, with the communication networks uh, group at RWTH Aachen, which was led by Professor Bernard Walke, who uh, is very well known in the area of um, mobile communications. Um, for example, modern, modern mobile communications transmit connected to the internet, transmitting data in form of packets really is, uh, it goes back to him when he developed uh, in the group developed the cell park um, uh, protocol that became part of um, of GSM, the second generation of mobile communications, as some some people might know, the GPRS, this acronym for General uh, Packet Radio Service. And uh, I also worked with uh, uh, Professor Kamalita Gurk at the time, who was 
um, uh, studying com communication networks in computer simulation. And these two elements really got me into the career I, I have been pursuing ever since, uh, computer communication networks and, com uh, and computer simulation. And these are topics I, I teach today in, uh, in our school here in UCC. Um, however, part of my final year project was spent at uh, the University of Strathclyde in uh, Professor John Dunlop's group. Um, and that's where I made my, met my wonderful wife, Jane, who was studying for a master's at the time. And um, romantically, I'm the boy from next door in the student residence. Um, but at the time, I didn't know that um, meeting a girl from Cork would mean there was only one destination, and that was Cork. So after finishing my degree and returning to Germany, I worked for um, um, two and a half years for Nokia um, in Germany and also in Camberley in England. And the work was focused on, uh, again, on telecommunications. I participated uh, in, um, in European telecom standardization. I also learned software engineering, something I hadn't learned in my degree course, um, but I learned this in industry and that became very valuable and it's it kind of strengthened um, and and enhanced the route to eventually ending up in in computer science where I always wanted to be um, but in 1995 John Dunlop came back um, and offered me a position a research position to study for a PhD at Strathclyde and so in January 1996 I went back to Strathclyde and um, and joined his uh, his group and um, we worked on um, mobile communication network problems in this that were very, uh, very prominent at the time. There were a number of European projects going on that defined what uh, was going to be the third and eventually fourth generation of mobile communications. And the group was very prominent uh, in this area. And quite interestingly, this is the, the Royal College building, which is the, the main building of uh, old, the original building of Strathclyde University. And just a little anecdote, some of you who, um, who might know the, uh, the Scottish uh, crime series Taggart, uh, in, in a number of Taggart shows, um, the entrance to Strathclyde uh, police is shown. And it's actually at this part, the, 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 the latter part of the, uh, of the Royal College building, which was the, is the J James uh, Weir building, uh, which is indeed not Strathclyde Police, but Strathclyde University. So that is, I always found that quite curious when I watched it. Um, and when I came to the, towards the end of my PhD, uh, my then wife, Jane, um, said um, when, you know, when I was thinking about what do I do next, she said, well, why don't you look in Cork? And so I did. And I ended up in, uh, at Cork Institute of Technology, where I started in 99, after finish my, finishing my PhD at Strathclyde. And I joined the Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering uh, as a lecturer. And um, around the time, in about 2000, um, I started uh, together with a colleague who had a very profound influence on my, on my professional life, Professor John Barrett. Uh, the Adaptive Wireless Systems Group. John and I move, joined CIT around the same time, and we joined forces and developed, uh, the, built the first uh, group that started off uh, in, in networked systems research in CIT. Some of my sort of highlights in, um, one of the academic highlights in CIT were that I led in 2005, the development of the first uh, mass in engineering in CIT, which, um, uh, is, uh, was in telecommunications engineering. And in 2007, John and I, and also with the, this, the, the contribution from uh, Kieran Delaney, wrote a, a proposal that we called NEMBUS, Networked Embedded Systems, which today probably would be called the Internet of Things, uh, uh, that we submitted to the HEA PRTLI Cycle 4 program. And in this, in this NEMBUS program, we put together uh, a large national research project um, with participants from um, a number of the universities, including UCC. So this kind of brought me in touch with uh, a lot of my, my current colleagues, in fact. And so, um, so I, I've known them for a long time. And it also uh, provided funding for the Nimbus uh, Center building. And in 2009, then, um, I became the, the first, the founding director of the Nimbus Research Center. And over the, the next sort of roughly 10 years, 
we built Nimbus up as a very significant um, applied research center focusing on Internet of Things topics with uh, supporting uh, local industry, building up energy, um, uh, building up uh, test beds, for example, and also establishing the, the technology, Nimbus Technology Gateway, the tech center, which uh, supports, uh, strongly supports local industry in their innovation needs. And as Sarah said in 2016, uh, CIT designated me as a, as a professor. But around 2018, I kind of felt um, I had brought Nimbus as far as I could, and I was looking for a new opportunity to do something different after such a long time. And uh, I saw an advert for, for a professor position in UCC and you know, knowing the school and having had uh, collaborations with many people over, over a long time, I felt you know, this could be a good opportunity. So I applied for it. And the, the former head of uh, school, Professor Comex Srinen and the former head of, uh, of college, uh, Professor Paul Ross put their trust in me and uh, gave me the opportunity and hired me. And in February, 2019, I joined uh, the, the School of Computer Science and Information Technology. Since then, I've been building a, a research group uh, in IoT and uh, with uh, un, un, the, a lot of uh, enthusiastic uh, and bright uh, young researchers um, uh, and working with them gives me, gives me great pleasure. And it's part of um, um, a bigger unit that we are putting together on network systems and cybersecurity. Uh, as Sarah said, is uh, a lot of my research is funded by Science Foundation Ireland, uh, Connect, Confirm. Um, I'm leading the Advanced CRT, which is a, is a new uh, center for research training, also funded by, um, by SFI. And this sort of, um, you know, kind of funds, uh, funds and, uh, and brings my, my research to life. So this is a little bit about myself. Um, and, uh, but I'll, you know, I, I also want to talk about uh, what kind of research do I do? And it's quite broad and I, I, I'd like to give some examples. And as I said, is, uh, at the beginning, it's focused on the internet of things with a view around sustainability. And there's two aspects to it. There's the IoT for sustainability and sustainable IoT. And let me start around first to, to, to say what, are, what is the Internet of Things? Um, it's effectively making everyday objects smart and connected uh, to the Internet or some network, some intranet. And we are all familiar, some of you might be are probably familiar with this, it gives us the opportunity to turn on our heating from our mobile phones or turn on and off smart appliances uh, connected to smart plugs. Some cities now are installing uh, bins, for example, that are internet connected and which tell the garbage collectors when they're full. Um, it, uh, it allows us, for example, to remotely turn on and off uh, charging stations to charge our electric vehicle, which I did from my phone last weekend when, uh, when my wife Jane was in West Cork and needed to recharge our, our electric car before coming home. Uh, it also, can connect ourselves to the internet through smart watches, for example, that we wear all the time. And a lot of people do this now, and it allows us to gather data on ourselves and see how are we doing. Um, if we look at the architecture of the internet of things, there is, um, it's kind of a, you know, in the simplest sense, it's a three layer architecture. There's a perception layer, which are sensors and actuators embedded into, into things that allow us to to sense what they're doing to, uh, and actuators that allow us to affect on those, to change states, for example. But these are not standalone, they're networked. And so a lot of my work is around this network layer and how to network these and how to build applications on top of it. And the applications, many applications are in the cloud, um, but uh, increasingly for applications that require more real-time performance, for example, there is sort of, Topics like edge computing are starting to appear and so on. And we, we can interface with these applications from our smartphones, for example, but from anywhere in the world. And that's the, that's the, the power of the internet connectedness. And um, I, I will talk about some of this connectivity and the challenges that, will, uh, that, that this will bring. Um, and here is, is a, you know, a little diagram with connecting the... Um, connecting the, the Internet of Things, which shows you lots of different logos. These are all different technologies that all try to do the same. And so it's a bit of a zoo, and I'll come back to that later on. Uh, but 
the potential of this IoT is, is in sustainability, for example. So if we can sense our world, then that helps us to understand our world. If we have data on it, if we have information on it, we can make sense. And if we're connected to it and have actuation capability, we can also control it so we can shape our world uh, in a positive way. So the opportunity here is to make our world more sustainable. And you know, if we look at this, how do we express sustainability? And I have borrowed here from the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which are very good and, and are becoming more and more prominent now in, in terms of how we should think about sustainability around our world. And the three, and while, while some of you might know that they are very interconnected, um, three sustainable development goals have uh, um, I have focused on. And the first one, I'll give some examples, are sustainable cities and communities. The second one is industry, innovation, and infrastructure. And the third, which I have started to work on towards uh, more recently, is good health and well-being. So let's look at some of the work uh, around sustainable cities and communities. I've done sort of uh, a, a very large number of projects, both nationally and European funded, starting around 2007. Uh, so some of the work uh, we looked at in the Nembus project that I mentioned was focused on it. Um, the first project, I, a SAFI project I was involved in was the ITOBO project led by Professor Carsten Menzel, who was a former professor of uh, 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 in, in UCC, for example. And through this journey, I have collaborated with a lot of people um, in UCC across Ireland and, uh, and internationally. And uh, if we look at some of the, the, the work that I did here and, and the benefits that uh, IoT can bring to uh, sustainability, um, we, we can look at uh, one example here, the, the cooperative uh, corporate project, which ran from 2012 to 2015. It was a framework seven pro project. And here we looked at how IoT service platforms can be used to create energy positive neighborhoods. So the idea here was that we would instrument urban neighborhoods, the buildings in urban neighborhoods with an IoT platform and uh, allow the IoT platform to control the, the flow of energy and the generation of energy. So, uh, so connecting uh, gen energy generation through local renewable energy sources, for example, um, and, and also the flow in and out of energy, in and out of the energy grid. And so we deployed a number of platforms in this, uh, when I, in CIT, at the time in CIT, we developed one platform that we deployed uh, around, the, the, around CIT. We worked with a, um, a French SME, Embix, that had their own platform and Intel who had their own platform. And what we did was um, we, we looked at how um, energy can flow uh, in and out of the grid and between the different buildings in the neighborhood. Uh, and the energy here, the, the, the local, locally generated energy, the energy taken from the grid, and then in order to service the demand. So this is an example, some results here of, of the work um, from a target week in 2015, where our local neighborhood comprised of the Nimbus Center building and the Leisure World uh, complex. So we had instrumented both buildings quite heavily, and we were able to um, take advantage of, uh, driven by the electricity price, which goes which, which really in real time is uh, determined by uh, energy demand, we were able to trade energy and use energy cleverly so that we were able to uh, save energy costs by shaving the peak. So uh, importing or storing energy locally when it's abundant and then using it when it's expensive or exporting it back to the grid to make money basically in order to support other elements in the neighborhood. And uh, the work of this project also resulted in a book, Energy Positive uh, Neighborhoods and Smart Energy Districts. Another project uh, I worked on, um, uh, which I in, in fact led, I was the coordinator of the project, was the GENIC project uh, focused on um, energy efficient data centers. And currently data centers are in the news. Uh, you know, we, we have concerns about the stability of the electricity grid in Ireland because we have so many consumers and so many big consumers like data centers, for example. Um, but here what we did was we, we looked at using IoT to instrument data centers very heavily. So not only instrumenting the, the environment, but also instrumenting the, the cooling system and in, in a way also instrumenting the compute systems to understand 
uh, when and how uh, compute, com the, the, the compute systems, the servers were using energy. So we developed a, um, a software platform, a distributed software platform uh, that was um, monitoring, predicting, and then optimizing and actuating. Um, and we had a small data center on the campus in CIT, um, where we, which we heavily instrumented, where we also um, installed uh, energy a heat recovery mechanism into the canteen, the main canteen in CIT. And we were able to demonstrate with this kind of system you know, uh, to, to control um, the, the energy consumption in such a way that we were saving a very significant amount, about 30%, um, um, about 30 of energy. So here you can see um, kind of an example of the results. So we, had a, uh, we took a summer baseline before the system was operational. Uh, the different uh, energy consumers here, like IT power, for example, cooling and others. And the total over the period that we measured was about 6,000 uh, kilowatt hours. And then with our system installed, we were able to demonstrate that during the, sa during, uh, the, the same lengths of period, uh, we were able to, uh, to bring this down to 4,300 kilowatt hours. And so we can see that IoT systems here can make a huge difference in how we um, how we manage our energy consumption in buildings, and ultimately save CO two emissions and contribute uh, to reduction in climate change. So, this has been a past work, but currently um, my work is is focused on uh, the other two. Um, sustainable development goals. So the, the next one is industry in this case here. So I'm working within the Confirm Center on the future of industry. And the idea here is with industry 4.0 is the, the, that you might've heard about is uh, to move away from mass manufacturing towards single batch, batch size manufacturing. So the idea is that we manufacture for you what you really want and not some product that is easy to manufacture and that is kind of okay, but really to serve your needs. However, that requires uh, that factories and manufacturing lines are highly, con highly configurable and programmable to be adaptive to the, the wishes of the customers. And, and that also requires that they become much more, um, use much more wireless technology so that they can move around. And if you look at the, the, the top right of uh, this, this diagram, this is a vision uh, from one of our industry partners in Confirm Johnson & Johnson, who are looking at a very flexible reconfigurable uh, factory in the future which will be which will have autonomous systems that are all wirelessly talking to each other and challenges here are for connectivity are uh, the the wireless radio environment which is very challenging but also making these wireless networks now reliable so that we can run control loops over it and so that nobody gets hurt that control industrial control systems actually work without hurting any of the the humans that are around and so what we're currently looking at is how do we do that? So we are modeling where we're, we've been looking at developing tools to accurately model uh, radio propagation. And we can see that uh, here is, if you see these lines, these are kind of standard models that are being in use. And the clouds here is actually what we are able to, uh, to, to generate with, which is much more accurate uh, with our tools. And uh, another aspect we're looking at that supports reconfigurability is where we have, uh, for example, very poor wireless connectivity, and you're all used to that from your from your phones, for example, or no having no Wi-Fi connectivity in a building, for example. So this is exactly the same situation here. But if we want to manufacture, we have to make this really reliable. And so we're looking at not only understanding the the radio environment better, but also identifying ways of overcoming this, in particular when we reconfigure the environment. So here, this is an example, uh, top right, for example, a little, little robot here that talks to a wireless access point, and then somebody puts, you know, something in the way because that's part of the reconfiguration. And here we're looking at new technologies that are called intelligent reflective surfaces. These are very clever antenna technologies to reflect these signals and maintain dynamically connectivity. We're also looking at how we can make um, these industrial, wireless industrial networks for, for uh, the Internet of Things uh, more robust or, uh, and deliver real-time performance. So here, this is work we did with, with Nokia in, um, in Dublin. 
and we studied how uh, machine learning now, which is is becoming much more uh, more and more prominent, also in the in the communications and comp in networking industry, how we can use reinforcement learning, which is a particular type of machine learning, uh, to make the network learn which is the best behavior. So which way to send data across the network, for example, to make sure that the data gets to the destination within, uh, within a deadline. And the deadline is determined by the control system, for example. So if a particular control signal arrives late, you know, somebody might get hurt. And so the idea here is to train the network to understand and to figure out which is the best way to meet the deadline. And so here we are showing the, 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 the dark red in the, in the middle diagram shows you um, how good we are with this. And our uh, reinforcement learning approach is better than anything else that has been proposed so far. Um, and then other, other work that uh, I'm doing with my PhD students at the moment, uh, funded from Confirm, is looking at how do we control over wireless networks, for example. And as I mentioned earlier, wireless networks are, you know, kind of provide intermittent quality sometimes. So you, you know this when, you know, when you can't hear somebody on your mobile phone, for example, because the, the signal is poor again. And so what we're trying to do here is figure out how we can, not how we can make the communication more reliable, but how can we make the control adapt better to the varying communication quality. And so we are looking at uh, concepts that are called self-triggered control, where the uh, where we use machine learning to decide when do we transmit the the control signal. And what we find here is that we can very this can work very well. And so there are some diagrams here, maybe a little bit small, um, but happy to 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 elaborate on that later. Um, where we are using machine learning to decide when do we transmit. Um, to overcome problems of um, errors on the radio channel when the connection isn't so good, and also to reduce the amount of data that we send. So currently, um, control over wireless requires you know, frequent transmissions, but we are able with, with machine learning-based self-trigger control, for example, to reduce that very significantly. So that means we can run control um, uh, control systems over the same type of networks, for example, that we could run other things over. We could run internet access over for, for, um, for accessing um, information, for example, in a factory, etc. Okay, and the third aspect that I wanted to talk about um, that we are looking at uh, in terms of, of making our world more sustainable is uh, well-being and health. Um, so what we are what we're interested in here is is how um, current consumer electronics actually can can support healthcare. And there's a lot of work going on in this space. It's 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 a quite a hot topic because of our aging society, where we are trying to use technology to help people to um, to live more independently. But also we can also use that to actually keep an eye on ourselves. How are we doing? And we all know during COVID. It was a very challenging time working from home, maybe being isolated, not being able to meet or visit our friends and so on. And a lot of people, you know, kind of found this very challenging and, and some people uh, develop mental health problems, for example, and sometimes never realized that until it was perhaps too late. And so um, the current technology that IoT, the, uh, these IoT devices offer us is, is that we can collect data also on ourselves to give us hints and to, to give us data to predict sort of early onset of feelings of social isolation and loneliness, of feelings of depression, for example. So here, um, I have two examples of my work is the first one <clears throat> is more looking at uh, the supporting aging, supporting assisted living. And then I, I give a brief example of, of research that we've just started. Um, uh, so the 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 research that we completed, uh, we called it Faultify. And here the idea was to use um, Wi-Fi, uh, standard Wi-Fi technology that everybody has at home now for fall detection. And so currently fall detection is those of you with elderly um, relatives, for example, know that there are lots of fall detection technologies out there. There are these pendants, uh, there is things that older people can wear and so on, and that when they fall, detect this, and they can either press a button to alert help, or there might be automatic detection, for example, and so on. But the problem with that is 
that you have to wear this. And if you forget to wear it, or if the battery is empty and you forget to recharge it, for example, you have no protection. So what we were thinking about is how can we make the environment clever to detect faults in the environment where, uh, where older people uh, live on their own. And so we looked at Wi-Fi signals here. So um, using a Wi-Fi access point to transmit regularly signals, which happens anyway when you surf the web, but we could also make it to transmit when nobody surfs the web, for example, and then have a couple of strategically placed uh, receivers in the environment. And this is really cheap because yeah, Wi-Fi access points now cost 20, 30 euro. The receivers cost 10 euros, for example. So this is really very affordable technology, which makes it very accessible. But what we, what we um, looked at is, can we use the signal that is received, the radio signal that's received, can we extract from that whether somebody has fallen? And it turns out that's the case because the electromagnetic wave that is, that is carries the, the radio signal is disturbed by somebody falling. And it's a, it's, it, what happens here is that it, it creates a Doppler effect, you know, whether that, that some of you might remember from, from school physics, for example, those of you who are, who are not physicists or, or engineers, um, the, you know, which, which, which we typically recognize from audio signals, but electromagnetic signals are similarly affected. And so we developed a data processing chain that was taking the received signal and actually creating a, a time frequency diagram of this uh, that you can see here in the bottom, the blue, the blue diagrams show this. Um, and we can clearly see a spike in this, which is the light blue, which indicates a fall. And so from processing these signals, creating time frequency diagrams, which uses similar technologies like image processing, for example, we were able to extract with high reliability whether a fall had taken place or not. So we ran a, a quite an extensive set of experiments in a different environments. So in the in the in the lab, uh, we also did this in student accommodation. So my students who were working on this uh, did it in their apartments. They did it in in a uh, in a bathroom, for example. So we installed the transmitters and receivers at key positions to understand what the impact of the environment is. And we ran a number of large number of falls, so three persons. Now we didn't do this with older people because you know you don't want to push older people over to 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 simulate a fall so those the, the three lads basically threw themselves on the ground and um, observing health and safety we used mattresses to smooth the fall but they were they, they had great fun doing this and so we sim we basically uh, captured uh, over 300 falls and then also 700 over 700 non-falls so non-falls were like standing up sitting down these kind of events to make sure that we were able to to um, detect uh, the different uh, events correctly. And we were able with the approach we took um, based on, on machine learning to detect over 80% of falls correctly. And so that's, that's quite enormous. I mean, if you, if you now imagine that you have an environment with very accessible cheap technology that you put in place for an older relative, and if they fall in their living room, for example, that can be detected by the system with 80% reliability. Okay, fair enough. Sometimes you still have a, a, a situation where maybe a, a, you know, something was the, a fall wasn't detected or so, but, um, but certainly in 80% of the cases, we were successful. So what we're currently, currently uh, we are, uh, we're going a little bit Further, and we're going to the to mobile sensing for well-being. And here, as I mentioned, we're looking at uh, using um, smartphones and wearable devices to capture uh, the behavior of their users, of their their wearers. So, uh, for example, uh, physiological parameters like the heart rate, which can be measured by um, by fitness trackers, for example. Now, this is not precise heart rate. This is all kind of trends that we are trying to understand or measure here. Physical activity levels, smartphone activity, the location where people are, and so on. And from this, from these, this, this sort of data, we can uh, learn behavioral patterns. And from the behavioral patterns, uh, we can also infer using machine learning tools, for example, um, what kind of in 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 try to infer what the kind of the mental state is. Are they happy? Are they not happy? Do they feel lonely, et cetera? And a lot of work has been 
uh, has go, gone, gone on in this, uh, this area, particularly in the US. There have been a number of very prominent research projects. But one of the particular things we're looking at here is, is to do this with a technology called federated learning. So we are learning on the devices themselves without gathering the data in a central point. And that inherently preserves the privacy. So, so the users don't give the data away they keep the data on their own devices, we learn, and we take the models, the learned models, and we combine those at a central location. So it's it's kind of, the, each of these models learn from each other, basically, in order to, uh, to be as accurate as we can. And this is collaboration um, um, with my colleague, with our colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Eleanor Bantry White in the School of Applied Social Studies. This is kind of funded through um, through the one of one of the students in the advanced uh, CRT uh, is involved in this and and the Enable program on smart communities, which is another SFI funded program I'm involved in. So this is is kind of examples of how how um, my research contributes, how research on IoT contributes to sustainability, but. I'd also like to look at the flip side here and look at this and say, well, you know, what are the challenges for IoT in regard to sustainability? I mean, you know, I, I pointed out we all have these devices now and they're all battery powered, for example. So that's that's a very large number of battery powered devices which have to be recharged all the time. Uh, they contain batteries which are not very environmental and fr environmentally friendly for example lots of electronics and we tend to throw these devices away you know so that creates electronic waste and a lot of the electronics have a rare earth um, elements in them which and some of them are actually part of you know kind of uh, conflict materials you know where in africa for example uh, you know these these materials are being mined uh, and the people who live in the area are subjected to horrendous situations. And, and so we have to be really uh, uh, really aware of, um, of that, all these electronics, all these smart devices and so on, that they, they actually come at a very significant cost to society at the moment. And we have to get better with this. So this is a huge issue for sustainability. Another aspect is the ever-growing number of these devices. So this is statistics here, and you can, probably a bit small. You, I'm not sure whether you can see the numbers, but this projected by 2030, there will be about 25 billion internet-connected devices. I mean, that's phenomenal. And, and so we, what we have to do is we have to kind of stop uh, throwing devices away. Uh, we have to figure out how we make this whole space more sustainable. So how do we repurpose? IoT devices, not necessarily for art, but to repurpose them to remain useful IoT devices to support sustainability. And one of the challenges is not only the ever growing number of devices that pose problems in terms of connectivity, but also, as I said earlier, the, the very large number of, of different technologies that are there that don't talk to each other. So how can we make this space more sustainable? So we have looked at this as well. So one aspect was how do we make connectivity more so, uh, scalable? Uh, how can we deal with the ever number, um, um, the ever growing number of devices, for example? And so we've looked at how do we um, uh, support more connectivity to make connectivity fairer, which means we have more devices and the devices all get good connectivity. So we've looked at that without using more energy and we've, uh, we've been able to improve that very significantly. We also have looked at if we use these devices, for example, in remote locations where there may not be internet connectivity, but we deploy devices, for example, for um, agricultural monitoring uh, in remote areas, for um, geological monitoring, for example. Um, there has been work in the past on deploying IoT devices uh, around volcanoes to monitor this and so on. So very often connectivity isn't there, but what we could envisage, we could send a drone there that collects every so often the data gathered by these devices. So we've looked at that and we've looked at how can we do that with a very large number of devices without, um, in a scalable way, so that we collect the correct data and without costing us huge amount in battery power, for example. And so we've, we've, we've made very significant advances in terms of uh, improving Fairness, improving energy conservation, and uh, and and gathering gathering data compared to state of the art technologies there. And again, like I'm, as you might have seen, I'm referencing quite a number of our publications here. 
another aspect that I uh, is interoperability. So I, I mentioned that we have this zoo of different technologies. So if we use this in, in, in smart buildings or smart homes, for example, then you might buy technology in Harvey Norman or, or um, PC World, for example, you know, smart home technology, you install that, it's all working. And then, um, you know, a, a couple of months later, B&Q advertises, they have a discount on this technology now. And you think, oh, that's great, you know, kind of, I'd like to add to the system I have. You go there, you buy them, and then you discover, actually, this was a different technology using different protocols, different communication technologies, and they don't, they, this doesn't integrate into the system I have, and you are frustrated. And so what we've looked at is here, how can we create, how can we create software platforms that make this interoperable? So we looked at this in a European project that I coordinated um, about eight years ago uh, for buildings. And this was the SCUBA project. So we looked here, collaborated with, with Philips and Schneider Electric to look at how can we create an interoperability that all of these different devices can work happily together in a building. And in fact, actually, also when one device fails, how can another device, for example, take over the role? So if a for example, if a presence detector fails, that might turn off the light in your office when you are leaving automatically. So you, you know, the, the light isn't on all, all night. How can that be replaced, for example, so, uh, with a CO2 detector? So if the presence detector fails, then maybe the CO2 detector can detect, well, actually, there's a much lower level of CO2 now. So there's probably nobody in the room and turns the light off. So things like this, as we looked at, to um, again, to enhance the, the sustainability of IoT itself. And currently, we're also looking at, uh, this is work through the Confirm Center, which where I'm col uh, collaborating with Professor Tiziana Magaria in, in UL, on how we can uh, use innovative programming mechanisms to repurpose IoT systems, to reprogram them in a very clever way that doesn't, um, doesn't require always a degree in computer science, for example. And uh, I've looked with a, um, a PhD student also at how we can uh, reprogram these devices once they're deployed in the field so that we don't have to send somebody out at high cost to collect them. Because that's that's often the case, because you know, in order to repurpose them, we have to send somebody out, they have to collect it, they have to do something, bring it back and so on. And in most cases we say, oh, it's not worth our while, it's too expensive. So we've been looking at how can we very efficiently reconfigure and reprogram them over, over the air, over a long distance. But finally, um, we are developing technology almost for technology's sake sometimes, it seems. And particularly with IoT technologies that we want to deploy in our environments, we often ignore the need of the people in the environments. And so what we have also started recently is to look at co-designing better IoT solutions with together with citizens. So this is an example of a project, it just highlights a project that we did a couple of years ago as part of the Cork Smart Gateway Initiative uh, with a, a group um, of older people in Mitchellstown. And so here the idea was deploying IoT technologies for assisted living. And so what we did is we we did participatory workshops with older people. We showed them what we have. We just spoke to them about it. We effectively co-designed the solution with them. And doing that leads to much greater acceptance of modern technology. It also um, helps with digital literacy. Um, and it also gives us better insight into what the needs of end users are to ultimately make better, create better technology, better IoT solutions that are much more sustainable. So what's next after this? And I always say, uh, you know, the, the Internet of Things is really anything you want it to be, and it's only limited by our imagination. But one of the, one of the things I'd like to give you as, as a final point is to think about is, so if we can instrument our physical world and we can get data on our physical world, now think about, you know, what happens if we combine this with augmented and virtual reality, for example. So could we imagine that we, when we, we have these kind of smart glasses, you know, like some of you might have heard about the Google glasses that Google had out, uh, had, uh, out uh, a few years ago. And you could, with these glasses, you could overlay information from the environment gathered by an IoT system. And when you look at the environment, you see things. 
you know, it would be helpful to kind of, for example, if you can't remember where you parked your car, you know, you could look around and suddenly it pings up and your car says, hey, I'm here. And you see this in your glasses or you see other things in the glasses. So, so this augmented reality, for example, could become really useful by linking it to the Internet of Things. Or virtual reality, one could imagine, and it's, it's almost, um, you know, makes me shudder almost the thought of it, but you, we could envisage that we live in our virtual reality and we are now able to transmit over the internet not only the data from sort of um, uh, sensor data from um, our environment, but we can also now transmit haptic information and olfactory information. So we could basically sit in our living room and, and create a virtual world that connects us through the internet to the physical world and lets us to some extent virtually experience our physical world. Now for, for everybody who can go out there and go for a walk in the physical world, we shouldn't do this, but it could be a solution for people who are, um, you know, who, who cannot go out or who are um, disabled, for example, uh, and who can't do this. So, so these are, these are, this is potential for the future, but in order for this, all of this to work, we need active citizen engagement, as I mentioned earlier, uh, gathering data on our environment, ourselves, and so on, needs to be done in a privacy-preserving manner, and we have to do this sustainably. We just, you know, we, we, we need to think very carefully about how technology works in this way, and it needs to be secure, safe, ethical, and inclusive. So that's kind of an example of some of my, my work. Um, it leaves me with acknowledgements, and there have been so many people I've worked with. Uh, there are so many people I'm currently working with that uh, if I started to name everybody, we'd be here tomorrow and uh, probably forget half of them. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge uh, current and former colleagues, students and collaborators. Um, a lot of people and I, those who are here uh, today and listen to me know who they are. They have had a profound effect uh, on my career, on me as a person. I've uh, tremendously enjoyed working with everybody um, and, you know, we, uh, the people we work with make our life and our career. So whatever I seem to have achieved, it was a team effort. Um, and I'd like to thank my family who have put up for, for decades with my um, drive and my obsession and, and, my, uh, and my workaholic uh, attitudes, uh, and I thank them very much for all of their patience. So thank you very much, and I hope you have enjoyed uh, this lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Dirk. Uh, so that, that was uh, an, an impressive overview of uh, the IoT and uh, what kind of uh, challenges and, and, and solutions there exist. So I think we have a few minutes for um, uh, for a number of questions, and um, there there is one question here that uh, that I of course like quite a bit, uh, and and the question is, um, you know, given the the increase uh, of cyber attacks and the industrial uh, IoT, so how, how does that look like? So and where is the, you know, where are we with the implementation of some standards to protect these infrastructures? Yeah, that's a that's a huge challenge, and uh, and uh, you know when every so often we we hear about those in the news. Um, yeah, I think I think being connecting our physical world to the internet uh, bears huge challenges because suddenly, uh, you know, bad actors could have access to it. So we need to look at um, at security solutions. Uh, they are there are um, a lot of standards agencies are working on this. Uh, they are mechanisms like firewalls, they are um, uh, mechanisms um, like creating different types of roles, for example, so not everybody can easily access and so on. Uh, it's, a, it's a very significant field. Um, I wouldn't call, I, I, I don't pretend to be an expert in this. Uh, I think that's more your, your area, in fact, but, um, but I think it's a, it's a significant challenge. Uh, and there's a lot of work to be done. And it's, uh, I guess it's, it's one of the big sustainability challenges for IoT. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, that uh, solutions are not, not there yet to, to declare the IoT um, completely um, free from any attacks, right? 
No, absolutely uh, not. Following from that, uh, from that question, another one here is that um, if we are building IoT systems and we are more and more depending on that, like uh, putting critical infrastructure um, that depends on IoT and, and our life then obviously depends on that. So how should we deal with that? Yeah, I think I think that's a, that's a, a very it, it is a cause of for concern. I mean, you know, kind of the markets drive ahead and companies see opportunities, so they put out technology there and so on, and sometimes not very well thought out. So I think I think what we need is we we need to work on the the, the scientific uh, foundations of dependability in this. So we need to we need more uh, work here on um, on formal methods, for example, to um, to formally prove that the systems are working. Uh, I, I think we need to do a lot more uh, uh, simulation work, for example, to figure out whether the systems are, are safe and dependable before we start uh, deploying them. And then we need to build up slowly from small test beds. Um, but I think, I think there's a lot more work done on, on the science of, of dependability. Another good question here that the audience has is um, uh, regarding reliability or dependability and reliability. So if you if you start to put everything on the on the IoT, your factories and so on, and suddenly you don't have any internet connectivity, uh, what do we do then, or how should we construct that to to deal with these problems? Yeah, I think uh, yeah, if we start thinking about it, then then we all should should not go out of the door anymore and stay at home. Um, yeah, I, I think I think we need to kind of think about fail-safe approaches, um, particularly in dependable um, in in situations like industry, for example. We um, we probably um, need local um, you know lo local edge servers that uh, run the uh, run the system so that we don't have a reliance necessarily on the internet. And as I said earlier, you know, the IoT is, is kind of connecting the physical world to the internet, but in fact, it could be an intranet. It doesn't have to be the open internet. It could be a, a localized network, for example. And I think, I think those are solutions that industry will adopt first before they open up uh, to, to the internet. Okay. And, uh, Rather than uh, focusing on problems, maybe maybe on solutions. So we we read about there might be, um, you know, energy shortage and electricity. There might not not be enough to go around. Um, do you see that the IoT and applications can can help us to overcome this this problem, or or what could we do with it in in this case? Yeah, I think I think I gave an, a, the example I gave of the cooperative project, for example. Uh, you know, kind of pointed into a direction here. So the the idea was to uh, to have local generation. But if we if we have an IoT type system that that uh, gives us information about the demand for energy, let's say electricity, for example, um, and we have extensive demand information, for example, um, then we can try to shift um, demand around. So we could, for example. Um, tell particular consumers to, to turn off, for example, because maybe they are not needed. Or we advise them maybe cook your dinner half an hour later, for example, to avoid a peak situation. Um, if we have information on all of this, then we can make decisions. And that's that's the, the opportunity that the IoT brings. And if we have, then have information on the electricity grid, for example, we can match demand and supply much better. Um, so that these are these are opportunities uh, that IoT give us, and and I think these are solutions that will need to be implemented in the future. In particular, if we want to have more local and renewable generation on the grid, we, it won't work otherwise. Okay, and uh, so that we can finish in time, I, I I pick a last question, which is kind of more more general and probably not not even just bound to the IoT, but uh, if you go and uh, and automate everything and uh, you know, uh, we probably then uh, require less less workers to do the same the same job, the same productivity. Is that not a bad thing if we uh, if you automate things away? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's a good point actually. And it's quite funnily, I um, I said to to um, uh, Marit, who's who's organ who actually organized the the whole event today. Uh, she, she made a comment and I said, well, you know, if all of this works, then we can we can all go to the beach and enjoy 
and enjoy a, a day in the sun and so on. And she said, whatever it takes, she supports that. So the, yes, I think the problem, uh, the problem here is that it could uh, and may make um, uh, jobs redundant. More and more automation could do this. But you know, in the 1980s, there were a lot of people were worried about the introduction of the personal computer and so on, might get rid of secretaries and all of this. And the reality has shown it hasn't done that. I think what we will need to do though is at the same time is look at the skills that are required. And we will need, we will have very different skill sets that will be required with automation. I don't think we we will get off get get, get rid of um, people doing work at all, but it will be very different work. And so that's for us as, a, as an educational institution, for example, something we, we really ought to look at. What are, the, what are the jobs of the future and how can we train uh, people today to, be, uh, to have the, the foundations to be adaptable, to, to adapt to the, the, the jobs of the future? All right, um, so in, in the, in the uh, sense of time, I think we, we, we stop that uh, questioning here uh, today. Uh, thanks again, uh, Dirk, for, for giving this presentation. And uh, of course, uh, thank you for everyone attending. And um, we didn't get uh, through all the questions, but I'm sure that uh, if you mail your questions to Dirk, Absolutely. he's uh, more than happy to, uh, to answer these. So thanks again and uh, have a good evening, everyone. Thank you.